We're trying a new thing today. Always good when you've got this much technology in front of you. <laughs> to try something. If you've got a, a tablet or a laptop in the room, you can go to pressfile.com slash mapboard and follow the presentation as I'm doing it, um, if you want to. So have a go if you like. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you today briefly uh, about the troubles we had um, before getting summoned. <clears throat> the impact that implementing a discovery system has had for us over at Sheffield Hallam University um, and the cultural changes associated with implementing that kind of system. Um, so as you can see, where no one has gone before, cultural changes. I'm just pausing to make the people at home think that um, it's all broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> But no librarian worth their salt would um, uh, resist the urge to acronymize anything. So um, instead of where no one has gone before, blah, 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 we could call it, we know, Gibi Weax, if you want. We could use that as a Twitter hashtag, but there won't be many characters left. Um, my problem here is talking about cultural change is hard. Um, and I'd normally try and butter up the audience um, by using lots of stereotypes and cliches and stuff, and obviously um, the kitten. But, but Dave speaks me to it uh, again by going first. So uh, we'll not even try to um, top that today. Um, okay, so in terms of our history with um, uh, Summon, uh, which we call live research at Sheffield, we went live. I was just talking to my colleague. I think we went live in September 2011, but we had a, a four-month uh, beta period where we um, practiced with it uh, as library stuff. Um, the discovery journey is a phrase I keep returning to when I start thinking on the way students use information um, uh, at academic level. And when we talk about the discovery journey, what I basically mean is um, uh, any journey that the student takes from thinking, I need an item, whether that's a physical item on the shelf, whether it's a video, whether it's a, a full text of an e-resource, um, the journey that they take. Um, whatever stage of their academic career, whether it's their first attempt to do something like that, whether they're really doing some advanced research at dissertation stage, their interaction with their discovery journey will affect the way they interact with the rich collection of academic sources that we expect them to use at academic level. So it follows them that we need to make the discovery journey as smooth as possible. Um, and in order to appreciate how the discovery journey has changed at Sheffield Hallam, we need to look at the old discovery journey. The old discovery journey. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, We used to say to our first year undergraduates, hi, welcome to university. Now you need to start searching for information. The problem is, if we say that, if any of us in this room say that to our first year undergrads now, they'll be going, well, I've been using information, I've been searching for information since I was old enough to hold a mouse. <clears throat> They've basically grown up in a world where Google will satiate their information need. And they come to university, and what was the first thing we showed them? Complicated interfaces, complicated federated search, complicated advanced library catalog screens, sometimes even an OPAC screen. <laughs> um, these tools are created by librarians for other librarians to use. Um, it's like we suddenly decided that um, our stuff was dangerous. And we didn't want people to interact with anything in the library for fear of death. Unknown man died eating library paste. What a great um, epitaph. Matt Reesman, who's a web librarian at Grand Valley State University, makes a really cogent argument that library websites, library catalogues, and databases in general are expert tools for experts. <clears throat> so no wonder that our students struggle. That's to excuse the colourful language from some of our um, Hallam suits. Library Gateway is pissing me off tonight. Um, well, it's not the fault of water. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to use the library gateway. Um, it took a good few minutes to find the library gateway on Blackboard. I don't care that there's a gazillion resources on the library gateway. Wiki is straight to the point and simple for me to understand. And this is still our competition. For me, someone was a massive step in being able to help move away from all of it. It enables the librarian to concentrate and focus on the journey rather than the tools used to get there. So I'm going to touch on five cultural changes today. Um, hopefully these uh, uh, titles will make sense as we go through the, the last bit of the presentation. The first one I want to concentrate on is help, or rather 
stop helping. One of the beautiful traits about the library profession is that inherent desire to help. It's built into um, uh, the reference institute, it's built into what we were taught at, at library school if, uh, or whatever it's called nowadays. Um, it's even built into Rang Amazon's law, it's that desire to help the user. Um, it's been a driving force for the profession in some ways, but I kind of feel like it's a bit of a blessing and a curse. Um, somewhere along the road, I feel like we started to lose our way. The expert systems I've mentioned already I mean that we come up with interfaces like the ones we've shown or even worse, tools designed to impede the discovery journey rather than help. And we need to shift away from that kind of um, practice. A different cultural uh, shift happened during the closed trial of Summon at um, Shepherd Hallam. Um, during our beta test of Summon, feedback came swiftly in from the academic librarian saying, this isn't, this isn't great, this is, this is not finding what we expected it to find, which is a real worry for the implementation team. Because the academic librarians were supposed to be our proponents of this system. They were supposed to go out to faculty and to students and say, look at this awesome tool. Um, and I got really nervous about it. So um, as you do, I went to a meditation session um, and stumbled upon a concept that for me at least begins to explain or began to explain some of the unexpected results we were seeing. Uh, Shoshin, or, or beginner's mind, comes from a guy called Shunri Suzuki. Um, and he essentially says that the mind of the beginner is empty. Three of the habits of the expert, ready to accept, to doubt, and open to all the possibilities. And when I started um, uh, applying that concept to the way I was using uh, someone, it became apparent why my results were dissatisfying. I had been using those hyper-stylized searches, throwing in all the boolean I could muster. Um, you know, my, my saved searches that I knew would work in an information literacy session. Once I started to move away from that and treat it more as a first-year undergraduate might use it, um, ignoring the boolean. Um, the results just became more meaningful. Connections between the search terms I put in and the results were much more meaningful. And it became uh, a much smoother journey, which led to this, um, uh, whoops, led to this um, quote. That, uh, the problem is something that students need to be taught how to use it, but librarians do, which uh, apparently I said on Twitter, but I'm, I'm refusing to own up to it. OK, third cultural training, expert listening. I've talked about this before, so apologies if I've covered this. Um, for years as librarians, we've um, uh, allowed our expert intuition to influence the way we present information to our users. And this partially plugs into the expert tools I was talking about at the start. Um, but it's more than that. I'm sure we've all been in those meetings where we think, oh, we need a list of FAQs for the first year undergraduates. And you come out with a long list that are, that are rarely Fs and sometimes not even Qs. And yet we throw them into a web page and expect people to, um, we push that information out and expect people to use it. But actually, we've got an expert blind spot. Intuitions are fast, but they are often wrong. So at Hallam, what we've tried to do is move to a model of expert listening, um, uh, where we sit down basically and do usability testing once a month, which is all what my breakout session is about. So um, we didn't do the elevator pitches, but um, if you want to come to my breakout session, I'll teach you how to listen to a student. Um, those sessions enable us to really listen to what the students are doing with the like, website, with some of the databases. And you get brilliant quotes like this. I never found stuff before you put the Google box on the library gate, which I'm not sure um, uh, the library director would appreciate is that we need to buy the, a Google box for the library website. But it works for students. Okay? They understand it. They get it. Um, fourth. OK, so OPACs or no PACs. No? I worked quite a long time on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we struggled with OPACs for years. There's been, there's been reams of um, uh, uh, publications on OPACs and why, they, why they're not great. And, and the, the examples I showed earlier, I think, are good examples of, um, uh, of why we don't need to use them as much with our students. Um, so we've moved the OPAC off the front page of the library website, which is hard for a couple of reasons, one of them being that um, someone is actually a, a, a few hours behind when you update your library catalog. So it could be up to 24 hours that deletions don't appear in summer. I'm unconvinced this is a problem. I think that bothers us as librarians much, much more than it would bother a user. The amount of items we've all got in our institutions compared to the amount of deletions we do on any one day is not significant enough to be nervous about this fact. What is there and what is updated uh, is, is availability information. Is the book on the shelf or not? And that's what students really need. Um, 
And that's hard for librarians because we use those tools. We use barcode search. We use uh, subject number search. So I say, yeah, keep a link. Bookmark the library catalog. Put it somewhere on a website. Call it an advanced tool for searches, uh, for, for advanced searches and librarians so that you're, you're giving people expectations before they get there. I think um, it was really hard to move the OPAC off the front page of the, of the website. Um, and it's going to be even harder to, to kind of remove it from the discovery journey in terms of when you click on an item in summer. I know Dave's done a lot of work at Huddersfield about this, and um, at UWE have got a very good implementation of how they link through to catalog things. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to what comes out of Dave's work. We need a shift from systems that librarians know how to navigate to ones that are intuitive to our users. Um, and that's the key thing about all of this. We need to shift from focusing on the hundreds of databases and the arcane complexities of Boolean operators. Um, and someone can contribute to this shift, and we can gradually go through iterations of the way we present resources. This is our, like a website about four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, now. Okay? So you can start rearranging stuff, you can start making things, and you can make it responsive, and people can use it when they need to use it. And we can move away from throwing these things in the face of students. If we use discovery tools properly and make gradual cultural shifts in the way we work, it allows us to become facilitators of learning rather than gatekeepers of information. The simple fact of the matter is that you can generally explain someone to first-year undergraduates the search, refine, get process. And one of the most wonderful things about the community around Summon is that we're sharing these experiences. And it often um, uh, duplicates experiences across institutions. So I asked Shannon over at Huddersfield saying that Summon enables them to move away from the mechanics of search and they can focus on critical analysis of the content. Um, I was a wee bit nervous about including this co uh, quote from Katie. And I asked her permission. She said it was fine. Um, the conversation that we, I was involved with on Twitter. Um, I kind of feel like uh, this is a really apt quote for what we're talking about today. Um, that professionalism sometimes can, I feel, come across as arrogance. And we, need to, we need to make sure we move away from that. Because when we do complicated search interfaces, when we impede the discovery journey, we create barriers to our users, which is what none of us want. It's hard to argue with Vaughan's quote here that connects users with the information they seek is one of the central pillars of our profession. And I feel like we can do that and we can become facilitators of learning if we use Summon and we use these tools to make the discovery journey really smooth. We need to remember we are not our patrons. There's some lovely um, uh, pencils here from I think, Walking Paper, which I still haven't found the station budget to buy, but I really like those. We're not quite in the place where this um, uh, where mock up here from uh, University of Illinois. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I kind of, I'd love that as, a, as, a, as an opening page for um, uh, students to find. If we do all that, we can be happy unicorns. Thank you very much.